alma mater or seven years in an English university, published in 1827, is the earliest detailed first down account of undergraduate life published in Britain. In 1996, it appeared in a microfiche collection. I wouldn't recommend trying to read that now. Then in a CUP reprint series in 2010, the Cambridge Library collection, collection, now defunct. Didn't make enough money. What the book really needed was a fully annotated reprint that would make its text completely accessible. And this was published by the University of Exeter Press in January this year. And yes, I am the editor. John Martin Frederick Wright, who was born in Lincolnshire in 1793, entered Trinity College in 1813 and graduated in 1819. His memoir gives a detailed account of his experience as an undergraduate in college and university, ending with his entry into the volatile metropolitan world of Grab Street and hack authorship in 1821. Alma Mater is a valuable source for the history of the university in the early 19th century, yet it's hardly been drawn on, let alone evaluated, until quite recently. In 1997, in the official history of the university, it was credited to another John Wright, a prestigious clergyman who died in his late 90s, full of honours and a friend of royalty. But he was the wrong Wright. <laughs> The right right, as we shall see, died in less than half that age and full of shame rather than honour. One way of evaluating Wright's memoir is to compare it with the American Charles Astor Bristed's much better known account of his own time as a Cambridge student from 1840 to 1845, five years as an English university, published in 1852. This book sold well on both sides of the Atlantic and went into several editions. Both men were at Trinity College, but their circumstances were very different. Bristol was the grandson of John Jacob Astor, who had been born in the village of Waldorf in the Rhineland. He made his fortune in furs and then in property, hence the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. And at his death in 1848, was probably the richest man in the world. Bristol was a Yale graduate who entered Trinity as a fellow commoner, though he later downgraded to become a pensioner. Fellow commoners paid extra fees and dined with the fellows. Pensioners paid standard fees. A commoner in Latin commensalis was one who shared a table. Some of you may remember that mensa is Latin for a table. So common was not an inferior category, as in commoners versus lords, but referred to those who dined at tea table with the fellows of the college. Wright's father had been reasonably well off, but lost his money after the collapse of an American bank in which he'd invested. His son entered Trinity as a sizar, a poor student who paid reduced fees. In the 18th century, they had waited on the table and done various inferior jobs, but by the early 19th century, this had gone. Wright begins his memoir very straightforwardly. In the month of October, 1815, I and lots more first saw the right as sons of Alma. Here we might think is an indisputable fact and one that any Cambridge graduate would retain firmly in his memory. But the college and university records show that he was admitted to Trinity on the 24th September 1813 and matriculated at the university in the Michaelmas term of the following year. As he graduated in 1819, he did indeed, as his title claims, spent seven years in Cambridge, 1813 to 19. Hence the difference from Bristed's title, five years, 1840 to 45. It's curious that Wright chose a title that so openly undermined the chronology he presents in his text. He reports the outbreak of fever in the university in the spring of his second year. It struck Jesus and John's and then quickly spread and all the undergraduates were sent home by order of the vice-chancellor. But this was in the spring of 1815, so earlier than his own claim to arrival date in October of the same year. Wright's title, Alma Mater, is a phrase meaning bounteous or sustaining mother, which had been in use to refer to schools and universities since the 18th century. Sorry, 17th. OED's earlier citation is from 1650. That's the recent edition of his, of his memoir with an image which I'll be mentioning later on. 
OED since 1650, but an image of alma mater had been used as an emblem, emblem by the university press since 1600. This is the 1600 book, and you can see that it shows alma mater Canter Canterbury gear on there, not entirely dressed. The bare breasts are legitimized by the conception of alma mater as a nursing mother. Some images show her with streams of milk running down from her nipples. I'm irresistibly reminded of the TV series Allo Allo, where a painting of the Virgin Mary is referred to as the Madonna with the big boobies. <laughs> Wright describes Alma Mater as a stately, magnificent personage about the age of Methuselah, who has 15 members, that is colleges, and is annually delivered of a numerous progeny of some four or 500 at a birth. In other words, newly matriculated undergraduates. In the first chapter of his book, he describes how as a freshman, he reveled in his newly acquired status as a gownsman, a member of the university, before discovering that his status was much lower than that of the junior and senior sophs, that is second and third year undergraduates, and of course the fellows and officers of his college. An initial tour of Trinity takes him through its courts and gates to the hall, library and chapel. In the hall, undergraduates of the same status dine together at different tables. Wright gives a vivid account of the experience. I like this particular this picture particularly because it's not one of those standard things of a big grand uh, room with everything laid out, but with, with usually not anybody there. Here we can see the hall with food being passed around um, and things are happening. People are talking to one another. Big joints are being served. For my part, he says, I had played a good knife and fork into a defunct cod's head and limb of a bullock, and had somewhat diminished the pies, puddings, jellies, blue mange, not blue mange, as the squint-eyed waitress behind me for years pronounced it, and trifle. This last was no trifle with me, for I ever regarded it as a matter of great importance, so accurately well was it whipped up at Trinity. The conversation on this occasion at the upper ends of the tables, where sat the seniors, was doubtless very superior. And it may also be reasonably inferred that these elder brothers should strive to lord it over the youngsters. At the head of my table sat Huell and Cape, who certainly did their utmost to astonish us and argued among, among topics many kind with much volubility. Jonathan Cape became senior wrangler, top of the maths tripos, in 1816, but is now forgotten. Unlike William Huell, who was in the year above right, having been admitted in 1812. He soon became a fellow, then tutor, master of the college from 1841 till his death in 1866. One of the greatest polymaths of the Victorian age, he's remembered, for example, for coining the word scientist in 1833. A freer and more flexible form of socialising was possible in the cloisters in Neville's Court, a favourite place for afternoon strolling, especially in wet weather. The reason is fairly simple. These are actually the only cloisters in Trinity. But even here, status differences were marked by clothing. The top hats that two of the undergraduates are wearing uh, show that they are noblemen, so able to invade some examination requirements and dine with the fellows, but obliged to pay higher fees. The caption specifies between 1 and 4, 4pm 4 being then the time for dinner. It gradually moved up to 7pm towards the end of the century. Wright's second chapter, Chapel Scenes, reports a long, perhaps rather overlong, series of furtive conversations between undergraduates, usually terminated by their being reported to the dean for misbehaviour. Each scene ends with a chapel clerk declaring, the dean will be happy to see you this evening, sir, immediately after chapel. Wright comments that after being warned by a friend that, and I quote, the, sheer, the surest road to promotion lay through a regular attendance at chapel, I never once was found wanting morning or evening at this muster room. But then discovering the real object of the thing, greatly at variance with the ostensible, I abandoned the project, clearly seeing it would avail me nothing at the examinations. He was referring, of course, to the disciplinary function of chapel attendance, chapel attendance at Trinity, something that a college tutor, Connor Thirlwall, complained of in the 1830s, and which was successfully challenged only in the 1900s by Francis Cornford, also a fellow 
and the author of an enduring guide to university politics, Microcosmographia Academica. In 1834, the master of Trinity, Christopher Wordsworth, brother of the poet, told Thirlwall the choice was between compulsory religion and no religion at all. Thirlwall responded that as the epithet compulsory applied to religion seemed contradictory, the distinction was too subtle for his mental grasp. Three days later, Wordsworth sacked him from his tutorial post. In 1838, Wordsworth tightened up the chapel walls for attendance, and this led to the foundation of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Undergraduates. <laughs> the title Echida echoed that of the RSPCA, which had been founded in 1824. The SPCU circulated reports on chapel attendance by the fellows, in which some of them scored very poorly. Indeed, two of them were given, as we say now, not one. One of these, Benjamin Walsh, lost his fellowship through marriage, emigrated to the United States, and ended up as the first state entomologist of Illinois. He corresponded with Darwin about beetles, and his findings were incorporated into later editions of The Origin of Species. Walsh died in 1869 after being hit by a locomotive on the Rock Island Line. You may know Lead Belly's famous 1934 version of the song, or perhaps the 1955 version by Lonnie Donegan, which began the British skiffle craze. In Wright's time, attendance was marked literally by markers, who walked up and down the lines of undergraduates, marking their names on lists provided there by putting pins through the names. In Wright's first term, there were, only, there were two markers, one of whom was called Anthony, but had no surname. According to Wright, he was the fruit of a liaison between a gownsman and a prostitute who lived in the notoriously unrespectable Cambridge suburb of Barnwell. Here's a sample of Wright's style. We had but two markers, and one of them, whose Christian name was Anthony, surname he never had, I believe, his mother residing in the rookery at Barnwell, and his partiality for the gownsmen, clearly evincing an alliance by blood thereunto, used to see many a one there who, knowing he had a friend in Mark Antony, was loud snoring at home. So he fiddled the marking. Calling Antony the, the marker, Mark Antony thus laptly compensates for his lack of a surname. This anecdote reminds us that Cambridge was both a university and a town. Town and gown were often at odds, and for much of the 19th century, the vice-chancellor had powers of imprisonment for women accused of prostitution. The proctors and their henchmen, the bulldogs, patrolled the streets daily, and physical violence was not unknown. That's the picture that was used on the cover of the edition. A notorious example was the Battle of Pease Hill in Cambridge Marketplace. Uh, characteristically of Cambridge, this is a hill which is hardly a hill at all. This took place in November 1820 and was depicted in the Gradus ad Cantabrigium, a dictionary of Cambridge undergraduate slang, published in 1824, from which this image is taken. The third chapter of Wright's book takes us on a tour of Trinity, including library, chapel, hall and its three courts, Great Court, Neville's Court and Bishop's Hospital. In 1824, these had been joined by a new court, built, built to cope with a sharp rise in undergraduate matriculations and a concern to have students housed in college to protect their morals. In the following year, an Act of Parliament gave the Oxford and Cambridge authorities power to detain women found talking with undergraduates in the street, something seen as evidence for prostitution. Wright also mentioned what he calls the fourth court, this was in fact the formal name for the college latrines, which were built into the bank of the cam for obvious reasons. And their, their remains can still be seen there, though to see the Trinity ones, you have to go across to John's. Undergraduates who left their rooms to go there were known to chalk gone for on their doors. When Queen Victoria visited in 1841, she was claimed to have asked William Hill, recently appointed Master of Trinity, what were the pieces of paper floating in the river? <laughs> he told her they were notices forbidding bathing. <laughs> the can was in fact an open sewer, 
and mains drainage was not installed till the 1880s. Wright's fifth chapter is devoted to his lectures. These took place every weekday in term time and followed a set routine, a mathematics lecture at nine being followed at ten by a classical one. Teaching was organised according to tutorial sides, the groups of students assigned to an individual tutor. In Wright's time there were two sides, and the mathematics teacher on his side was given by John Brown. At nine o'clock on the first day of term, the lecture room filled up with about a hundred students. John Brown was a likeable man and the uh, respected by his pupils who called him Johnny, though not to his face. At 10 o'clock, they moved upstairs to the classic lecture room where they were taught by James Henry Monk, who as well as being a fellow of Trinity, had been since Richard Pawson's death in 1808, the university's religious professor of Greek. Monk was a very different person from Brown. He stood on his dignity and had no nickname. Wright refers to him as Professor Monk and adds, we never used any darling diminutives in reference to that gentleman. Here is a drawing of a Trinity lecture, clearly on a smaller scale, given by John Wordsworth, the master's eldest son, in 1835. Wordsworth was a promising scholar, but died prematurely in 1839. The drawing's valuable in showing a lecture room in use. The artist was in fact one of the students depicted. I think he's the one on the left. But as you can see, this is a much cosier affair than the lecture writer describes. The desks in the lecture rooms were furnished with pens, ink and scribbling paper, thin coarse paper a little larger than foolscap. During the Tripos examination of 1791, William Gooch of Keyes College wrote in his diary, the first known use of the term, between one and three o'clock I wrote up nine sheets of scribbling paper, so you may suppose I was pretty fully employed. By the 1810s, Cambridge mathematics teaching had shifted onto paper. Freshmen were urged to abandon their slates and protractors and rely simply on paper and pencil. Only lines and circles were involved and they could be drawn freehand. When Wright reached Trinity in 1813, he was examined by the tutor John Hudson, who told him, at this place all things, prizes, scholarships and fellowships are postponed not on the greatest readers, but on those who, without any assistance, can produce most knowledge upon paper. You must henceforth throw aside your slate, which tells you brought with you, and take to scribbling upon paper. You must write out all you read, and read and write six or eight hours a day. Don't be alarmed at your scanty progress in the mathematics. When I first entered college, sir, I knew less of them than you do. There's Trinity Hall again, with an exam in process. This is from 1842, from a book by a German, Huber, uh, which is a useful, useful supply of such images were not, which are not easy to find. And here again, papers, paper, pen, pens and ink were provided. All this reminds us there was a material aspect to the history of mathematics in this period. High quality paper was made from rags, much of the supply coming from the continent. And this was severely affected by the blockades of the Napoleonic Wars. Paper taxes went up in the 1790s, and from 1794, paper was charged by weight rather than by ream. And this meant that printing paper, which was heavier, was dearer than writing paper. But about half the paper output of British mills was of inferior paper, often called whitey brown. You can guess why. And the declining rag supply led to the exploration of cheaper alternatives and of bleaching techniques. Prices went down in the 1810s when new technology was introduced. For example, the Fordrinier printing machines, patented in 1806, which spun a continuous web of paper at high speed and were used for newspapers. Printing paper was used in Cambridge for the textbooks written by its mathematicians. These ranged from editions of Newton's Principia, through books which explained and interpreted Newton, to original discussions of problems in geometry, algebra and mathematical physics. Some of these books were either translations of late 18th century works by French mathematicians or original works that pursued the new algebraic perspective they had introduced, which competed with the geometrical analyses of Newton and his English followers. The new perspectives were popularised in Cambridge by the Analytic Society, founded by Charles Babbage, John Herschel and George Peacock. Their project of translating French works was in progress during Wright's undergraduate career. 
In his first term in October 1814, it was introduced by, and I quote, a third year man, alias Seniorsov, over head and ears to my dismay, with French mathematics. I crossed three quarters of the differential and integral calculus frightened me most. His fright was understandable, since Lacroix's work was in three large format volumes and in French, expensive to buy and hard to read. Mathematics was the dominant subject in the Cambridge curriculum, and the mathematical tricourse was the only degree examination there in Wright's time. The classical tricourse was first examined in 1824 as an optional extra available only to those who had already gained honours in mathematics. Students who came up from the classics-dominated world of the public schools faced a steep learning curve. First-year college examinations were largely classical, but those of the second year were dominated by maths. The Cambridge curriculum thus offered a reverse image of that in Oxford, where classics was dominant, and until 1864, students could not sit mathematical examinations until they passed in classics. In both universities, examinations were moving from the medieval tradition of oral disputation to the written examinations we now take for granted. In Cambridge, candidates were pre-sorted through oral contests before entering the mathematical tripos, where written examinations introduced the then novel principle that all candidates were asked the same question. Something else we take for granted now. Latin was the language of the disputations, and its quality was often dubious. One professor was remembered for shouting when a dog entered the examination room, Verte canem ex. <laughs> Turn the dog out. At top left, the moderator sits in splendour. Uh, beneath, beneath him, somebody is going to advance a particular proper proposition, like Newton was right to say X. And on the other side is his opponent, who will say Newton was wrong to say X. In 1817, Wright was required to undergo such an examination, but his, on, on his way to the examination hall, found an escaped bull threatening a mother and child. He stepped in and was charged, ending up with his hen at hand stuck in a shop window. As a result, the moderator let him off the examination. In 1818, he was listed again, but the list was so long the examiners never reached him. Oral exams took a lot longer than written exams as candidates were examined individually. This was one reason why the system shifted to written exams. One of the examiners was George Peacock, fellow of Trinity and generally known to undergraduates as Gentleman George, like Johnny Brown, someone they actually liked. Peacock promised him a private exam and then forgot all about it. When it came to the Tripos examinations in January 1819, Wright found that because of his lack of an oral examination result, he would be examined in an inferior class. And he decided this was unfair. So he would go and sit in the Gulf. The Gulf was a notional place where a student could go to avoid being examined for an honours degree, for example, through illness. He would then be given a pass degree without examination. So he became a BA, but without honours. The marking system was symbolised above all by the reverence felt for the top scorer in the first class, the senior wrangler, who is the man half right who's lifting his cap, his mortarboard, to the gent in the middle in red, who is the vice chancellor. The other end of this scale was occupied by the lowest scorer, known as the wooden spoon. Between them, these two positions embodied the worship of competition. The spoon was informally presented to its holder, this is entirely unofficial of course, by being, uh, by being lowered on a string at the degree ceremony in the, in the Senate House, the undergraduates in the galleries, infiltrating the official actions below, while the proctor and his bulldogs did their best to capture it with a large pair of scissors by cutting the string. Here are the five surviving spoons. <coughs> Uh, from an exhibition at John's in 2020. The, uh, the, the early, earlier spoons were based on malting shovels, the first four from the left. Uh, later, they were based on oars, uh, which you can just see, that you can see from the top that it's an oar. After graduating later in 1819, Wright returned to his familiar reading in preparation for the fellowship exam at Trinity to be held in September 1820. 
He wrote, for mathematics, I stuck close to my old friends, Newton, Monge, Lagrange, and Laplace. That nicely sums up the combination of the continuing centrality of the loco hero Newton and the recent analytical and algebraic developments imported from France. Wright now kept himself going by taking pupils, but ran out of money, was imprisoned for debt, and so lost his chance to enter the examination. And his final chance was lost because apparently he just got to Cambridge too late. As with a lot of his narrative, it's, it's a bit hard to believe some of these things. Having now been in London for some time, he was established as a hack author in Grub Street. Between 1822 and 1836, he produced some two dozen books, almost all in mathematics. In December 1825, Wright married the 14-year-old Mary Ann Moriarty. Their first child, Frederick, was born in 1827. Five more followed, three boys and two girls. When he was not in debtor's prison, Wright supported himself and them by tutoring and writing books. His career as an author began in 1822 with a new edition of Newton's Principia. His next book, Solutions of the Cambridge Problems, 1800 to 20, provided a bank of past tripos papers with solutions added. It was the first publication of its kind in mathematics. His later publications were largely aimed at undergraduates, although some clearly had autodidacts in mind with titles beginning self-examinations or self-instructions. In 1830, he began issuing a weekly instructional magazine, The Private Tutor and Cambridge Mathematical Repository. This ran into the following year when the issues were collected as a two-volume book. Two of his books, both published in 1827, were of a very different kind. One was the memoir I'm talking about, Alma Mater, published at the beginning of the year by the London booksellers Black, Young and Young, who had also published some of his maths books. It contained copies of several examination papers and a long section dated Advice to Terence, in which he surveyed the character, scholarships and fellowships of the Cambridge colleges. Wright's publishers stressed the multifunctional aspect of the book in their advertisement. The uses of this work are various and important. It is interspersed throughout with scenes of real university life. It describes minutely the course of education pursued at Cambridge. This was the kind of bookmaking, making also appealing to different audiences and markets that he also practiced with his mathematics books. A review of the book in the newspaper, The Atlas, was probably written by another Trinity man, Henry Sullen, who graduated at the same time as Wright. Its most memorable comment on Wright who it claims was known as Wretch Wright as an undergraduate, is that his face was, and I quote, universally described as appearing to be cut from that heat which usually graces the door of a stable. In other words, awful. I did wonder about horse dung, but I ruled it out. Wright was offended enough to sue the newspaper's proprietors for libel, but the court of King's Bench found against him in July. The review, which was read out in court, declared that even the notorious courtesan Harriet Wilson, whose sensational memoirs had been published in 1825, would not have identified her paramours as Wright, as Wright had identified the contemporaries he'd criticised in his book. Wright's counsel objected to the comparison of his book with Wilson's memoirs, which he called the most profligate work that ever disgraced this country. Counsel on the other side was Henry Broome, a rising Whig politician who became Lord Chancellor in 1830 and one of the founders of the New London University. Broome denounced publication of details about his Trinity contemporaries, declaring that the reviewer's critique of Wright had merely paid him back in his own coin. Broome did not refer to the notorious Harriet Wilson, perhaps wisely, since he himself had been one of her lovers and had been for some years submitting to blackmail demands from her to avoid having his name publicly linked with hers. The only other review I found begins, the author of these volumes, as he himself indirectly tells us, is a Mr Wright. After an unsuccessful residence in Cambridge, he's been driven to seek a living among the booksellers of London. And finding that among the existing discussions concerning education, his university experience was a saleable article. He compounded a book of a very heterogeneous description. It is partly personal, partly literary, partly scandalous, 
partly a, a depot of examination papers, partly a repertory of ancient jests and stale stories. It is, in short, the scrapings of the author's life, collected industrially for the lord of all purpose of getting a dinner. The work is something of the quality and character of those receptacles that are always found near the offices of a large establishment in which the offals of the house are thrown for the ulterior use of key pigs. I think this reference suggests that both reviews were written by the same person. The review ends, it may serve as specimen of the candour with which Mr Wright has written and his account that he studiously conceals the fact of his having degraded, that is, of having descended from a struggle with his equals to contend with the men of the year below. Hence, of course, Wright's having spent seven years in Cambridge rather than four or five. At some point, he took a year off. This practice, known as degrading, became increasingly popular in the 1820s, and this led in 1829 to a regulation that those who degraded could not obtain scholarships or sit, sit for honours without special permission. The blunders of a big wig. The other right, the other book right published in 1827 was this one. The blunders of a big wig or Paul Price peeps into the six many sciences. This was an attack on the first two of the six many pamphlets published by the Society of the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. The author of the pamphlets was Henry Broom one of the founders of the society, whose role in Wright's libel case surely explains why he was singled out for attack. <clears throat> Wright's teaching career can be followed from his occasional advertisements through the records generated by his several spells in debtors' prison and in three applications he made for support from the Royal Literary Fund. It had been set up in 1790 and has been known as Royal since 1842, when it was given a warrant by Prince Albert. In May 1831, Wright announced that he rented a large house in Regent's Park, where he proposed to give tuition according to the method of the celebrated Dawson of Sedborough. John Dawson of Sedborough in Yorkshire was a self-taught mathematician who between 1790 and his retirement in 1812 was the most successful private tutor or coach to Cambridge men. 11 of his pupils had become senior wranglers. His method, imitated by Wright, involved placing pupils at separate tables and walking around giving advice. In 1841, Wright claimed that he taught 675 pupils in this way. So Wright's publishing history extended from 1822 to 1836. It's not clear why he stopped publishing, but we can learn something uh, of his life after 1836 from his three appeals to the Literary Fund in 1837. 39 and 41. They report he was in, employed by an actuary. This is a route taken with several other mathematicians to keep themselves alive by applying their knowledge of prob probabilities to the work of insurance companies. His final letter reported that he had lost his wife, not through death, but through adultery, presumably hers. At this point in 1841, five of his six children were in the Lampert workhouse in London. You might think, could his life get any worse? Well, it could. His file with the fund ends with a report of his arraignment on several charges of petty larceny. On 23 August 1841, he was tried at the Old Bailey, pleaded guilty and was sentenced to seven years transportation. After several months in a prison hulk on the Thames, he left England on the convict ship Isabella in debt. January 1842, arriving in Hobart, Tasmania, then known as Van Diemen's Land, four months later. On arrival, he was put on a one-year probation programme, which was designed to lead convicts from heavy labour to lighten duties, and then in some case even to freedom. But on the 9th of September, he suffered a fatal stroke. The only description we have before his transportation is the unflattering comparison with a bucket of offal. His convict record, however, provides a detailed account of his appearance. Just under five foot two, grey eyes, grey hair, brown whiskers, complexion freckled and lightly pockmarked. At his death, he weighed five stout, 13 pounds, 11 ounces, about 38 kilos. At his trial, he'd been described as stout, but he must have lost a lot of weight on the long journey to Tasmania. Wright's story is a bizarre mix of success and failure, 
His college career was marked by high achievement, first class marks in all the college examinations, and a scholarship in 1818, which made him eligible, eligible for election as a fellow. The misfortunes he suffered in his tripod examinations, the failure to examine him, the encounter with an enraged bull, were remarkable, <coughs> one might almost say un unbelievable. The route to a Trinity Fellowship was tried independent of this, but once again he missed the boat. His career as a private tutor and author seems to have brought him back on an even footing, but his marital difficulties then apparently led to a life of petty crime, transportation and death on the far side of the world. Can we learn anything from this story? Wright's biography is striking in itself as a human story of ambition and talent, success and failure. But it also throws considerable light on the Cambridge of his time through the detailed account he provides in Alma Mater. This was first drawn on very minimally by the historian Dennis Winstanley, who produced four books on the history of the university in the 1930s and 40s. But Wright himself stayed in the shadows until the 1990s, and even, even then, as I explained, he was misidentified. Not till this year, two centuries after the publication, of the memoir, has his full story emerged? Or has it? The fissure of obscurity and revelation I've told is both depressing and encouraging, and it may be that we will learn more in the future. Thank you. Please. I bought a copy of it about 20 years ago and read it and was interested but didn't pursue the man himself. About 15 years ago, I worked on the other memoir that I mentioned, the Bristed one, got very interested in him, went to the States and did some research on him and then produced the edition which, as I've done with Wright's memoir, I introduced in a way that would make it, you know, more useful as a source for university history. And then uh, at some point about two years ago, I decided that Wright deserved the same. He was much less well known. It's, if you had to balance them up, it's probably not quite so useful for its period as Bristed is. But Bristed was talking about the 1840s and Wright about the 1810s. And for that period, we really had nothing else that was like this. Um, I'm interested in the role of proctors um, I do have a personal interest in this because my great-grandfather was a proctor at Keyes, I think, and his brother was a proctor at Trinity in the later part of the 19th century. What can you tell us? I understand that the proctors were um, patrolled the streets at night and were allowed to, um, to lock up both undergraduates and prostitutes in cells overnight. Do you know anything more about the proctors and uh, have any good stories about them? I do a little. Um, the proxies were originally the, the main um, executive officers of the university. They were originally in charge of examinations amongst other things and the power of the examiners and moderators, first moderators and then examiners as a kind of inferior version of the moderators, um, was originally a power delegated from the proctors. Um, there was a proctorial cycle so that the colleges took turns in nominating fellows to exercise the proctorial function for a year. There was a cycle of 51 years and some colleges had more turns than others because they were bigger. Um, the, the university authorities didn't have the right to lock up undergraduates unless there were proceedings under civil law. But um, the... The power to control the streets was for a long time delegated to local authorities. But in the 1810s and 20s, it became clear that they weren't being effective. And so in Oxford and Cambridge, the existing rights of the university represented by the vice chancellor were extended. And um, an act of parliament was passed in 1825, strengthening this um, in, the difference was that in, in Oxford, people were mostly given a wrap over the knuckles and sent away. But Cambridge had a little prison called the Spinning House, 
which was on St Andrew's Street. It was knocked down in the early 20th century. Um, and women thought to be of easy virtue were imprisoned there, uh, usually for between 10 and 20 days. Um, this caused a lot of difficulty in relations between the university of the town. And there were some celebrated cases in the second half of the 19th century where uh, people, young women, were rescued from the Stilling House by groups of townspeople. And it eventually got all so embarrassing that they, in the 1890s, the vice chancellor's rights were taken away and given to the local authorities. Um, this has been written about a couple of articles about it, one about Cambridge, one about Oxford, which if you were to identify yourself at some point, I would try and send you. And there's, of course, you're the person who wrote them. <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, so the proctor, to be a proctor, you had to be um, a fairly senior academic or a wrangler or someone who'd done very well in exams if you were actually responsible for moderating and um, setting no, exams? The, the, um, so at this point, the proctors have got nothing, nothing to do with the exams because all the, all the control has been passed over to the moderators and examiners and uh, their main public visible function was to roam the streets, mostly at night, uh, with their bulldogs, who were college porters who were uh, conscripted to run behind them. Uh, this meant, of course, they had to be fairly physically active. In the early 20th century, uh, a notorious fellow of Keyes, Sir William Ridgway, protested that one of the proxies uh, appointed that year wouldn't be any good because he was you know, small and thin, uh, whereas uh, T.R. Glover, a well-known fellow of St John's, was applauded by him because he was a big brawny fellow and looked like a proctor. Um, yes, Wright was, was found seeing someone called Susan Stern in the street. He mentions this in the memoir. Um, and he was reprimanded by the dean. But the um, undergraduates involved would be subject to collegiate, not university public punishment usually, although if it was something serious, they could go to the vice chancellor's court. He had his own little um, assembly, which could punish uh, punish undergraduates directly. Thank you. How long did these rights last? It was only the over the twentieth century. How long did these um, the, the university's rights uh, to lock women up last? Was it would it extend into the 20, early twentieth century? No, Sorry it if I've missed the date. Taken away in the eighteen nineties. And the spinning sense itself was was knocked down, I think, in, in uh, 1901. Thank you. Thank you.